Welcome, Ben Runner. My recent video counting down the greatest home computers of all time as voted for by you, link in the description for those who haven't seen it, showed us several things. Firstly, that people still have an incredible amount of love and nostalgia for these old machines, and that passion is very much focused on the big brands like Atari, Commodore, Sinclair, Apple and Acorn. It also showed me that you, my viewers, very much want to see more home computer related videos on the channel. And that got me thinking about the machines that didn't make that list. But not just any obscure computer or failed home micro, the ones from major companies that have somehow now been forgotten. For every ZX Spectrum, Amiga, Atari 8-bit or Apple II, there's another home computer that failed to capture the market and quickly sank without a trace. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this video. Those experiments that went wrong, those innovations that nobody wanted, and those design ideas that look great on paper, but not in practice. Here we have machines for five of the biggest and most famous computer manufacturers that nobody remembers because they failed so badly, being greatly overshadowed by their more famous siblings. But were these computers hard done by? Did they deserve more attention? And did consumers miss out on something genuinely special? Let's recount the stories of each one and analyse what went wrong in a bit more detail, shall we? And if you were unfortunate enough to own one of these failures back in the day, to make sure you tell me your own stories down in the comments. Now let's get going and tell the stories of five computers from famous PC companies. Discover a world beyond your wildest dreams. Discover Atari. Pioneers in coin video games like Centipede, Tempest, and Asteroids that challenge you, excite you, test you like never before. Discover the Atari that opened your eyes to the world's most popular home video games like Space Invaders, Missile Command, and Warlords. Discover the Atari that brought you a home computer truly designed for the home. Sophisticated for advanced needs, yet simple enough for your child to use. Compose music, play advanced games, manage your finances, all at the touch of a button. Discover Atari. Atari! And discover how far you can go. So let's start off with a company that started it all as far as the video game industry is concerned, Atari. They changed the arcade industry forever with the debut of Pong, showed that home video games were the future with the 2600 VCS, and wowed audiences everywhere by launching the first home computers to feature custom chips, the 400 and 800. But the Atari of the late 80s was a very different company to the one that came before it. Now led by tough industry veteran and former Commodore founder Jack Trammell, their focus was no longer on video gaming and more on serious home computing, which was very much shown by the release of the 16-bit Atari ST. But the ST range wasn't the only computer being developed at Trammell era Atari, as they also dabbled in a rather different sector of the home computer market in 1987, albeit only briefly, in the form of transputer workstations, which, for those who don't know, are special computers designed for graphic-intensive applications, somewhat like the more famous silicon graphics machines. The Atari ABAC ATW Transputer 800, or Atari Transputer Workstation to use its much simpler name, was a joint project between Atari and a British company called Perihelion. Perihelion Software was founded in 1986 by one Tim King had left his job at Metacomco along with a few other employees to form the new company. They soon started development of a new parallel processing operating system known as Helios. At about the same time Tim's colleague Jack Lang started Perihelion Hardware to create a new transputer based workstation that would run this new OS. While at Metacomco the Perihelion software team had worked with both Atari and Commodore producing SD Basic for the former and Amiga DOS for the latter. Due to this previous relationship, they contacted both companies about their new projects, and Commodore were the first to show interest. 
creating a demo of Perihelion's new transputer via an add-on card running inside an Amiga 2000. But whilst they were mulling it over, Atari swooped in. Using a similar idea to Commodore, Atari combined the transputer technology with their own Mega ST computer, creating two different models. The first was a card that connected to the Mega ST bus expansion slot, and the second was a standalone tower system containing a miniaturized Mega ST inside. The external card version was later dropped for unknown reasons. The machine debuted at the November 1987 Comdex with the name ABAC, but it was later learned that the ABAC name was already trademarked in Europe, so the product name was changed to ATW800. A deal was struck for Perihelion to remain the exclusive distributor in the UK, with Atari handling manufacturing and worldwide marketing and distribution. A first run of production prototypes was released in May 1988, followed by a full production run in May 1989. In total, only 350 machines were produced by Atari before they lost interest in it, preferring to invest their limited finances into the new STE range and Lynx handheld that they had recently acquired from Epix. Perihelion were reportedly furious with Atari for ending the contract early and leaving them in the lurch. As they still owned the technology, they then sold it on to Dutch company ST Microelectronics, who bought all the rights to the transputer and continue to use an evolution of the technology in their integrated circuits and set-top boxes today. I've always been of the opinion that Philips are really overlooked in the home computer and console arena. The Dutch company and their various subsidiaries like Magnavox and Signetix were responsible for systems like the Odyssey 1 and 2, Videopack, MSX and CDI, as well as contributing to many others like the Advanced Programmable Video System, Atari Jaguar CD, and indeed pretty much any system that used a CD drive, given they were the co-creators of the standard itself. But alongside the many successes, they also had a few failures, and none more so than the ill-advised VG5000 computer. Developed by Philips themselves and manufactured by their French subsidiary Radiola, it was sold under both of these brands in the Netherlands and France respectively, as well as Schneider Electronics in Germany. Hitting the market in 1984, it was promoted as an entry-level computer, but ended up costing more than many of its more powerful rivals like the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64. It sold fairly well in its first year, mainly helped by Philips striking a deal with the Dutch government to place it in schools, but tailed off very quickly due to further price cuts from Philips' big rivals and the arrival of new 16-bit machines like the Atari ST and Commodore Amiga. Like the MSX, which Philips was marketing as their more premium offering at exactly the same time, the VG5000 featured a Zilog Z80 CPU, a minimum of 16K of RAM, a derivative of Microsoft BASIC, and numerous expansion options but it also had vastly inferior graphics and sound chips, offering up only 8 colours and one channel of audio. It was also fixed to a single low resolution video mode and had slow tape based storage. The weird non-standard chiclet style keyboard was also a big downgrade. The name of the computer did nothing to help its success either, as the VG moniker was also used on both Philips MSX1 and MSX2 computers, albeit with a different series of numbers after leading to much confusion amongst consumers, with many expecting it to be MSX compatible. It was quietly withdrawn less than two years after launch, and very quickly forgotten about. If you grew up in the UK in the 1980s, then you'll most certainly be aware of Sir Clive Sinclair's wonder machine, the ZX Spectrum. It revolutionised home computing in my homeland, becoming the first colour computer that could be bought for less than £100, and went on to sell over 5 million units. A huge amount of current industry figures have stated that they owe their career to the ZX Spectrum, and its influence on the video game industry really can't be understated. The Spectrum was followed by the failed 16-bit Sinclair QL, though this was strictly promoted as a business-oriented computer. Before we saw the last real Sinclair Spectrum in the form of the now highly sought after 1 to 8K, or Toast Rack as it's better known. This wasn't on the market long before Alan Sugar completed his purchase of Sinclair Research's computer division and replaced it with his own range of Amstrad produced Spectrums that included the 1 to 8K Plus 2 and Plus 3. 
By 1988, 16-bit computers had begun to dominate the market, and Sir Sugar decided to slap the Sinclair name onto an existing Amstrad machine in the form of the PC-20, which looked very much like the competing Atari ST and Amiga with its compact design. Apart from the badge, the only difference was a change in colour from white to black, but this vastly underpad MS-DOS compatible CJPC was never going to compete with Atari and Commodore's offerings and disappeared from the market within a year. And with it, everyone very much thought they had seen the iconic Sinclair branding for the last time. But unknown to almost everyone, Amstrad introduced one more computer that would carry the famous Sinclair branding. Most curiously, alongside their own, in the guise of the APC386SX. As you can probably guess by the name already, this was a far more capable computer, being based on an Intel 386 CPU and was widely compatible with all existing PC compatible applications. Thanks to its more traditional pizza box style design, it was also much simpler to upgrade. Nobody is really sure why it featured both brands on the box, perhaps because Sinclair was more associated with gaming, whilst Amstrad had become a very strong business brand, who knows? As for why nobody seems to have heard about this machine, it could possibly be because it was launched at the same time as Amstrad's enhanced CPC Plus range, which included their attempt to gain a slice of the lucrative console market in the form of the failed GX4000. Amstrad had thrown their entire marketing budget behind the launch of these new machines and all other computer hardware was of secondary importance, meaning no effort was put into marketing the Sinclair APC at all. Also known as the TRS-80 Model MC-10, this computer isn't to be confused with the regular TRS-80 or indeed its successor, the Tandy Coco. And putting the famous TRS-80 moniker onto this micro is indeed very misleading, because it isn't compatible with the range or even based on the Xilog Z80 CPU, which is of course where the name derived from. It was created by Tandy as a low-cost entry-level machine to compete with the likes of the Commodore VIC-20 and, even more so, the Sinclair ZX81, which was also launched in North America as the Timex Sinclair 1000. But by the time it finally limped onto the market in 1983, the home computer industry was in a very different place. Newer low-cost, more powerful machines like the Commodore 64, Atari XL and Sinclair ZX Spectrum had hit the market and these had very much pushed out all the entry-level offerings. This meant that the woefully underpowered MC-10 was basically obsolete upon arrival. About the size of a hardcover book, the MC-10 came with a 4K of RAM, an 8-bit Motorola MC6803 microprocessor, RS-232 serial port, and graphics capabilities very similar to those of the original Tandy Color computer using the same MC6847 video display generator. It also included BASIC and ROM and used regular audio cassettes as storage. Text and graphics are displayed on the television set via a built-in RF modulator and its small chiclet keyboard was similar to those found on computers like the Mattel Aquarius, Texas Instruments TI-99 and Sinclair ZX Spectrum. The expansion capabilities were almost non-existent at a time when this had become a big draw for home computer hobbyists, and the range of software was extremely limited indeed. Although Tandy withdrew the computer less than a year after it hit the market, it didn't stop them licensing the design out to French electronics company Matra, who produced an official clone of the MC-10 called the Alice, which featured a much funkier bright red design, but was otherwise identical. Given Commodore are credited with having the best-selling home computer of all time with the C64, it's only right that I save their most obscure micro until last. It's also worth noting that Commodore were a company that have often been criticised for spending far too much time and money on pointless machines like the Plus 4, C64GS and Commodore 900, rather than focusing on the systems that made them famous like the VIC-20, Amiga and of course the aforementioned C64. At this point it's also worth remembering that although Commodore are very strongly associated with video games, business was always their primary focus, especially under Jack Trammell. Indeed, the full name of the company was Commodore Business Machines, and this is very much proved by the computer that we'll be looking at here, the CBM2. 
Now we know what you're saying. What was the CBM-1 then? Well, technically speaking, it was the Commodore PET, a hugely important computer for the company, which pretty much dominated the low-cost home business computer market for years. But by 1982, it had been on the market for five years and was starting to look a bit long in the tooth. Despite many updates and revisions, the IBM PC was starting to make real inroads, and other companies like Apple and Tandy were also increasing their market share. So Commodore knew it was time to come up with a replacement, and this computer was it. But despite being a follow-up to the PET, it was a totally different beast in almost every regard. The angular looks of the PET with its strange key setup had been swapped for curvy lines and a much more traditional full-travel keyboard. In fact, when the CBM2 was first shown to the press, it was nicknamed Porsche PET, due to these unique looks and somewhat incorrect rumours that the case had been designed by the famous German car company. Although Commodore did initially consult Porsche for a case design, it proved too expensive to produce, so Commodore enlisted famous computer designer Ira Velinsky to create one instead. It also had a very different hardware setup too. Gone was the famous MOS6502 CPU, and in its place was the enhanced MOS6509 processor instead, with the option of an Intel 8088 or Xilog Z80 coprocessor. And when we look at the rest of the hardware, things start to get a bit bizarre, because the CBM2 was sold in two different versions, the P-series, standing for personal, and the B-series, which of course signified business. The P-series featured the VIC-2 video chip, as seen in the Commodore 64, and also included two standard Atari-style joystick ports. In the P-series, the 6509 CPU ran at just 1 MHz, because it also had to support that VIC-2 chip. But in the alternative B-series, it utilised a 6545 CRTC video chip instead, to give it an 80-column green screen monochrome display which was much more suitable for word processing and spreadsheets, of course. Both the B and P series machines have the famous SID sound chip, again like the C64, but the B series' 2 MHz clock speed makes it impossible to read any of the SID's registers. And I'm sure you've now spotted the problem with the CPM2. It was a highly confusing mismatch of two different machines with quite different hardware setups, making them only semi-compatible with each other and ones that didn't offer many, if any, advantages over Commodore's other home computers, the PET and the C64. Consumers were confused, the press were perplexed, and businesses were baffled, and the high price of the computer didn't help matters either, being much more expensive than most of its main rivals. It lasted less than two years on the market, with most of the machines either being liquidated or shipped to Germany, where some people did actually buy it, believe it or not and it's reported that only 10,000 CBM2 computers were ever made, so it's no wonder nobody remembers it. Feel a bit out of step with computers? Does all that jargon trip you up? <laughs> You're not alone. But now Commodore Business Machines have introduced the PC Starter Pack. You get all the kit, computer, monitor, and three business programs to get you off on the right foot. What's more, there's a companion video to teach you everything. Step by step by step. Until you're really in the swing, there's free software support, plus free on-the-spot maintenance. The Commodore PC Starter Pack. Available from selected stores and major independent retailers. Or call 01-873-9800. And that rounds up my look at five failed and obscure computers from famous PC companies. Can you think of any other obscure computers from the industry's big names that could have been included on this list? Or did you actually own one of these and want to tell me your own experiences? As always, I love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get to in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Grady Haynes, Mitchell Valentino, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olson, Dos Gamerman, Sonic Mania 999, Paul Daniel, Andrew McKay, Retro Resolution, Matt Standish, James Taylor, Trogdor the Burninator, Mins, 8 Guy, Luke MC, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. 
You can get access to future content including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.